So hi, I'm Kat Powers. I'm here today with Matt Mitchell from the Office of Health and Human Services. And we're talking about opiates. We are, yes. So what are opioids? Sure. So um, basically they're a type of drug um, that derives from the resin of the poppy plant. Um, that's the more natural version. And then there is also the synthetically made version, which is basically made in labs by scientists, chemists. Um, and those would be more of like the painkillers that you may see um, prescribed by doctors, uh, where the opium plant one is more of like your traditional heroin, um, mm -hmm. which is illicitly made uh, versus the others that are prescribed through doctors for various pain management um, and support uh, for major surgeries or major mm -hmm. injuries for folks. Okay, so some of now uh, the words opiate opioid, does mm -hmm. it make a difference what I'm using? Uh, so opioid, opiate refers mm -hmm. more to the natural plant version. Opioid okay. is more of the synthetically made version. Okay. Um, and they both act on the system the same. So mm -hmm. it acts on your central nervous system. And then uh, they attach to specific proteins on your brain, spinal cord, and gut. And then uh, when they bind to these receptors is when someone may start feeling that euphoric feeling mm -hmm. associated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when more and more bind, that's when you get more into the overdose okay. uh, concern. All right, so when we're talking about this, you mentioned one drug that uh, a name I recognize, which is heroin. Yep. yep. Are there other opioids, opiates, that we're talking about here? For sure, yeah. So heroin's the most traditionally known, um, mm -hmm. but we're also talking about Percocets, mm -hmm. Vicodin, um, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, mm -hmm. um, Methadone, Suboxone. Uh, and then the big one is fentanyl, um, that I think is really fueling a lot of the opioid crisis right now. Um, and that's a whole other uh, opioid that I think um, people uh, are learning more about, unfortunately, because of its devastating effects. Okay, so heroin mm -hmm. is uh, something we've been dealing with for the longest time. Sherlock Holmes himself had a, had a heroin problem, right? <laughs> Fentanyl, what exactly is that? Yeah, so it's a synthetically made drug. So it's one that's made um, by chemists in a lab. In a lab, yep. okay. And uh, it, was, it does have some limited medical use. It was really meant for um, pain management in high surgery, like a, a surgery you may have had related to cancer pain or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then doctors started manufacturing and distributing it for other uh, more wide market uh, use, trying to tell people this is a, an opioid that can really help any pain that you may have, mm -hmm. downplaying, downplaying some of the um, addictive qualities of it. And the, the concern with it is it it's acts very quickly in your body. Um, it's in your body for about two to four hours, but it's probably the most potent of all these, other than carfentanil, which is another even stronger version of fentanyl. Um, Car fentanyl. Carfentanil, yep. Now, uh, that that prefix does that what does that mean to fentanyl uh it's just the stronger version of fentanyl so uber it, yeah it's right. it's it's, okay. it's it's a version that is very potent very strong okay uh and so once it started getting manufactured and marketed as a something that can help minor mm -hmm. um, surgeries um, that's when we started seeing its presence illicitly uh, and licitly through prescriptions uh, hit people's um, pharmacies or hit the streets. Uh, and so it's cheaper to manufacture and uh, it's easier to, to distribute for illegal markets. Uh, Fentanyl is cheaper to manufacture than heroin? Yes, so it's being actually mixed in with heroin oh, uh, wow. to extend the supply of heroin. Mm -hmm. uh, and also um, people are seeking it out because of its potency and uh, its it's just a different experience than heroin. Uh, and so if you're someone who's been using heroin for a long time and looking for a different feeling, uh, fentanyl unfortunately is giving that to people, but also giving people much more risk when it comes to overdose. So if I, uh, and correct some of my misunderstandings yes. here. Yes. So um, there's heroin. Mm -hmm. um, you can add fentanyl uh, to it to extend your uh, your high your use of heroin your batch yeah your batch mm -hmm. okay um, if I understand correctly some people are getting fentanyl not realizing they're purchasing drugs with fentanyl in it correct yeah so um, especially now because fentanyl comes in powder form mm -hmm. so it can be mixed in with any other powder form or, or medication that can be pressed for example so it's making its way into heroin okay so when you say that that's like chopping up pills yes is that what you mean yeah, so making okay. making a pill uh, or you know taking a powder and making mm -hmm. it into a pill. Okay. Um, people are, are, are mixing in fentanyl with heroin, but it's also making its way into other drugs like cocaine, which is a powder-based drug, um, even Adderall, illicit Adderall, uh, that people may not be getting from doctors or prescribed. Uh, and that's the real risk when it comes to fentanyl, because if someone is getting an Adderall and not expecting fentanyl to be in it, um, they, they act very differently, and Adderall is a stimulant. Mm 
mm -hmm. and uh, fentanyl is a depressant because it's a, an opioid. And so it's acting on your body in two different ways. And having that present is, is the risk in, in and of itself for an overdose, where if I'm expecting Adderall and I get fentanyl in it, I don't want, to know. I don't want fentanyl in my product. So there's some harm reduction techniques called uh, fentanyl test strips, mm -hmm. which you can per get through us at HHS, which are basically, if you have any product that you want to test before you use, it will allow you to test whether or not fentanyl is present in that batch. So the, this, the city understands that there are folks who are using drugs. Yep. You are giving out these test strips to use with your illicit drugs. Yep. Yep. What's the reason behind that? Harm reduction. I mean, that, that's and honestly... you're saving lives. And we're saving lives. Yeah. I think that the main thing is that we acknowledge that drug use is going to happen, mm -hmm. and we, we acknowledge that drug use and, dis and addiction is a disease and should be treated like we would treat any other medical condition to keep someone alive. And so fentanyl test strips, although it may seem counterintuitive of like, why would I test those? Like, what does it matter? Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's not expecting fentanyl in their drug may make the choice or have the opportunity to make the choice to not use that drug based solely off of the fact that fentanyl is present. So what, we live in a world where overdoses are gonna happen. So yep. what are the things we need to talk about when we're talking about you know, you say harm reduction, I say saving lives, yep. because, you know, harm means like, you know, don't bump your elbow <laughs> for me. Right. Um, it, if you're saving lives, mm -hmm. what are the things that we need to know and talk frankly about overdoses? I, I think honestly is that it's a preventable disease. It's, it's something that individuals, um, if they're given the uh, appropriate amount of education, mm -hmm. the appropriate amount of support, uh, we can manage it in a way to keep people alive another day to seek out treatment. You know, treatment is a, is some, someone might not want to seek out treatment. You know, our hope is that people will seek out treatment, but that takes time. People are at different stages of change. So if I'm not really even thinking about changing what I'm doing right now, I'm not going to be ready for that. But we want you to be alive for you to be ready. Whenever you want to make that decision, you have an opportunity to say, hey, you know, I think this is the time where I need to get some support. And so I think for us, we really want to encourage people um, to, um, support people. So if you see an overdose, we'll go over a little bit as to like what, mm -hmm. what to do, but we want you to intervene. We want you to treat it as a, as a medical, an emergency the way that it is. You know, there's a lot of stigma that gets attached with yeah. that. Uh, you know, we want people to intervene for an overdose, potential overdose, like they would with a heart attack or like any other thing that they may see where they call 911 and they get the person the support. We want to take it out of the moral failing uh, and get people to understand that it really is something that can be treated and, and it is the, a disease that is really impacting many, many people in our city and in globally as well. So I, you know, it, a heart attack can happen, you know, at a restaurant. Yep. I'm not going to blame the restaurant because right my uh, uh, family member had a heart attack in right. the restaurant. Right. Um, where do overdoses happen? Um, can happen anywhere at any time, really. Um, in Somerville, we have some data to suggest that it's happening more in private residences and mm -hmm. less so in public. Yeah. Um, and there's some concern there because uh, we really encourage as one of our risk factors is not using alone. So if people use alone, uh, they may be more vulnerable to experiencing an overdose because mm -hmm. there's not somebody else there to call 911 to get them help. Mm -hmm. And so, um, well, that's why we encourage people use in pairs or using groups so that if someone is using, the other person can be ready with Narcan, can be ready with 911, ready to go. Um, unfortunately, we're averaging about 15 overdoses, fatal overdoses uh, a year here in Somerville, uh, 15 to 20 over the, I would say, the course of the last six to seven years. Um, and, you know, this is why this education is needed mm -hmm. and some of the resources that we're trying to distribute because we're hoping that we can make it very um, easy for folks to get the access to the harm reduction resources mm -hmm. and some of the education so that even if they're not the individual using drugs, they may know someone who's using drugs and they can help support whether uh, that, however that may look for them. There's a stigma involved. Yes. You know, yes. I mean, if I know my mom mm -hmm. is using drugs, yep. um, it's kind of, it, that, that's hard to talk about. Yep. Yep. How, how do I go about asking for Narcan if I'm worried about my mother overdosing? That's, I, that is the trickiest thing. I think we see with stigma is that, I think a lot of people don't fully understand what stigma, stigma means yep. and its impacts. And I think the biggest impact is someone's willingness to seek out recovery because mm -hmm. it's a really hard thing to talk about. It's a lot of shame, a lot of guilt for people. Yeah. And because you know the way it's been depicted in movies, TV shows, even just in general public, it's my fault. It's something I made a choice to use a substance, and yeah. it's, it's because of me. Where 
there's a lot of issues of uh, history, you know, a history of drug use in your family um, that people need to consider. And if I feel like if I reach out, someone's going to judge me or I'm not going to get treated in a way that I should get treated, I may not want to reach out at that point. And so a lot of it is education and a lot of it is just the language that people use. You know, I, we try to avoid the, the slang, you know, the words that people use. I don't even want to say them because I, I just I don't want to encourage people to use them. But using some of those more person friendly, person centered words like people who use drugs, yeah. um, using words like instead of clean needles, it's unused needles. Mm -hmm. That way you're changing the narrative as a community member. And then you can kind of contribute to the overall opinion and the overall, um, I guess, how people talk about individuals who use drugs because once we start changing the narrative, hopefully people will start feeling more comfortable to reach out because they say, hey, this person seems like someone that gets it. Maybe I can talk with them about it and maybe I can get the support that I need from that person. So it's tough. Stigma, stigma is definitely something that complicates things. Mm. Um, and, and I think we're trying to make as much low threshold access to care as possible, but it can be challenging when not everybody is uh, saying the same narrative, I guess. Well, so there are 15, 20 people, 15, 20 people too many who are dying Agreed. of overdoses in Somerville. Yep. Are, and it's not folks hanging out in parks. It's not all people who are, no. Do we, are there particular demographics? Are there groups of folks who are more vulnerable by age, race, income? I think we've definitely seen in the state at, uh, uh, in, at, in general where um, people of color have been pretty disproportionately impacted, particularly during COVID. Um, but I do think that there's a misrepresentation of, it's, it's an unhow, you know, individuals who experience homelessness that they're using drugs. They're the, exclusively the individuals using drugs. That's not the case whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know, we work pretty closely with our organizations and our nonprofits here in Somerville. And yeah, there's people who use drugs who are also experiencing homelessness, but there are people who are using drugs that are living and working and you wouldn't have any idea whether or not that person is using. And yeah. so it, it's something that's tricky because it's easy, I think, sometimes to just assume that people are doing certain things based off of stereotypes. But um, I think it can, our big message is it can happen at any time to anyone, no matter your means, where you come from. Um, and we want to access or get you access to things at wherever point you're at. Is there a real stigma to somebody who is seeking recovery? Mm -hmm. Is there a stigma to people who are in recovery? 100%. Yeah. I think. Um, it's great to get them in recovery uh, and get the person to understand that like this is something that could benefit. Um, but not every treatment modality works for people. You know, we talk about giving an array of options. So you know, if talk-based therapy is the way for you, then that's the way for you. If medication-assisted treatment is something that's for you, then that's something for you. But I think unfortunately, society sometimes tries to get fix-alls, one fix-all for everybody. It'd be easy to find Ex one thing, exactly, right? Exactly, exactly. But we have to kind of look at it at an individual level to see, okay, what's going to work for me or what's going to work for you and how can we tailor our services to you? All right. So we can't figure out if somebody is going to overdose based by their race, gender, where they live, their income. What do we look for? <laughs> so I think the, the biggest thing is... Um, having open and honest conversations with folks of, you know, if you're starting to notice things that are off, and I say that very generally because mm -hmm. you're gonna know the person that you love or the person that you care about most. You know, if they're starting to see little things that um, are adding up of like something might be going on, we wanna encourage people to let's talk. You know, have conversations as to say like, hey, I've been noticing X, you know, is everything okay? How are you doing? Even little things like, you, you okay? <laughs> like, how are you? Like those, conversations that sometimes I think can be hard for people to initiate. Uh, we actually have a training that's coming up tonight, actually, uh, for it's called Let's Talk, where we're uh, having one of our staff in the department talk about how to broach these conversations with youth, um, where they may be noticing certain things, whether it be like relationships, maybe grades, maybe just behaviors, um, mood changes, uh, and how parents can proactively have conversations about what their expectations are for substance mm -hmm. use and opening and creating a dialogue to say like, this, I don't want this to be a one-off conversation. I want this to be something that if you find something coming up, we can talk about it. Like I can be seen as a resource, not me personally, but if I was the parent. Um, so I think noticing some changes in behavior, noticing some um, maybe just how the person is um, 
interacting with substances or if you're, you're noticing that uh, the substances are becoming more dependent or there's certain things like if it's someone who uh, had a surgery, for example, and they were using an opioid to manage that, and then that started becoming more of an addictive. Those are the opportunities we'd be like, "Hey, what's going on here?" Um, I would we encourage that people start talking proactively with doctors. You know, if they're having any type of surgery, to be aware of like, "What's what? What would I potentially be on?" You know, is are these addictive things? Are these things that can have negative impacts for me down the road? Even though short term it might help my surgery, uh, what am I going to be looking at? You know, long term because. Mm -hmm. Questions, having those conversations are powerful. All right. <laughs> All right. Common signs and symptoms yes. of an overdose. All right. Yes. So we, we're, we've, we're, we're beyond we suspect a problem. Yes. Yes. We are at the point where we believe somebody has taken a drug or too much of a drug. Actually, how do I talk about this? Yeah. Is this okay. yeah, too much of a drug? taken too much of a drug. Too yep. much of a drug, okay. Because yep. like, is there a certain amount of heroin that is safe? Um, there is, uh, I mean, it depends on the person. You know, there's okay. gonna build a tolerance over time. Um, yeah. The recommendation from a harm reduction standpoint mm -hmm. is if you're gonna use drugs, you start slow in small amounts mm -hmm. and then work your way up if you're okay. going to, you know, do so. We obviously don't encourage that, but mm -hmm. we encourage you start small and, and, and work here and you know your body best you know when we talk with individuals who use drugs yeah. that's one of the things of like I know my body and, mm -hmm. and I know how it's going to impact me and then they take some of the other harm reduction strategies like I'm going to use this amount with a friend here and then I'm going to make sure that if I have anything here are the things that you need to look for okay. you call 911 for me so all right uh, so if, um if if somebody is watching this yep and um uh, they are around someone who has, for whatever reason, uh, ingested too much of a drug. Mm -hmm. What am I looking at? All right. So one of the main hallmarks is the heavy nod. So that's going to be when your head is really, um, basically, un you're unconscious. So your head's going to be really down. You're going to be not breathing or very labored breathing. Mm -hmm. um, you also want to look at the color of the fingertips or... Um, lips, mm -hmm. where if you're of a lighter complexion, you'll probably be a bluish, purplish color. If you're a darker complexion, it's more of a grayish color. That's an indication that you're not getting oxygen to the brain. And so what happens is if you're unconscious, you're not breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you're seeing any of those main things, there's a whole bunch of them, uh, but those are kind of the main three. I would say the heavy nod, the skin color, and the breathing. You want to check the breathing. Um, what you want to do is you want to take your fist and make the knuckles, run them across the middle of your sternum. And then this is going to um, elicit a pain response that if the person is conscious, they'll say something or they'll be like, oh, that probably mm -hmm. hurts. But if they do not respond to that, it's likely that they're unconscious and not breathing. Um, you can also do it across the top of the lip and across the top of the eyebrow. And I'm literally taking my knuckles yep. and yep. pressing hard. Yep, press hard. You don't want to do it too light because you want it to see if the person's going to elicit some response. It's right. the best response. It's the best practice for, you know, instead of like, yelling at the person or kicking them or causing any other harm, this, if you do, is going to elicit a pain response that if they're conscious, they'll say something. Okay. And so if you see any of those, that's when you want to start transitioning into basically what we call the big three. You call 911, uh, you give rescue breaths or CPR to the extent of your training, and you give Narcan. Okay. Um, calling 911 yep. brings the cops. Correct. What do I do? Uh, so what we do is you call 911, uh, you call the EMTs, uh, mm -hmm. you call the, the operator, you're going to just basically say, hey, I've discovered somebody who's not breathing, mm -hmm. uh, and they look to be unconscious, I need some support. Um, they're going to walk you through kind of like what to look for and what to do, but okay. the encouragement is you stay with the person uh, if you feel comfortable doing so. Uh, you also be very descriptive as to where you are, um, so that like if you're in a building, you know, you want to say, I'm at so-and-so address, tell mm -hmm. the apartment number, leave the door open so that the EMTs are, can get there very quickly because time is of the essence when mm -hmm. it comes to this. Um, and then if you're outdoors, maybe give some type of landmark or something or what street I'm on, I'm wearing this shirt or anything. Okay. Um, EMT or the operator is probably going to ask you some of these, prompt mm -hmm. you because it can be really overwhelming to, yeah. to manage all of this. Um, and luckily here in Somerville, I would say the majority, well over the majority of our police officers are trained in CIT, which is crisis intervention training. Uh, our core department, which stands for Community Outreach Help and Recovery, uh, it's in the police station, uh, but they're the social work unit of the police station. Uh, so they are trained, are trained to train officers on how to manage situations related to mental health crises or overdose. 
Um, so they're, they're doing it in a supportive way and kind of using that trauma-informed work to understand there's a lot that's going into this situation right now, so I need to know what to look for and how to best interact with the person. Okay, so I've run my knuckles against somebody okay. pretty hard. Yep, yep. They've responded and sort of perked up. Mm -hmm. Are they out of danger? I would say no. I would still say you could call for a wellness check yep. to, for 911 just to make sure that something else isn't happening. Mm -hmm. They can always at that point make their decision mm -hmm. uh, to not seek medical help, but somebody can come. They can talk to somebody. A medical professional can make that decision for you, mm -hmm. uh, but you've done what you can in that moment to maybe get that person help. But at the end of the day, they can make that decision for themselves. All right. So um, if I really suspect this is, a, a, you know, I've seen somebody using or I know somebody is taking way too much of, uh, they're, uh, they've been, you know, doubling up on the, the painkillers or, or, you know, that they've been prescribed. Um, what, what do I do at that point? I, I've called 911. Yep. So 911 is the first start. Mm -hmm. If you don't do anything else, 911 is the first thing and thing you need to do. The second thing would be giving rescue breaths and Narcan. So rescue breaths, um, we actually give out rescue breath masks as mm -hmm. in our department. Mm -hmm. Looks something like this. Um, there's different versions of it, but the main concept is so that you could put this over the person's mouth okay. and then breathe through this little um, area so that you can get oxygen to the, to the brain. So like we were saying before, if the person's not getting oxygen, you're going to be providing that oxygen for them in that moment. So the recommendation is um, two breaths every five seconds, um, and then both Sometimes people do Narcan before the breaths. Like it doesn't really matter. Um, our recommendation is you give the Narcan if you have it available. So this is what Narcan looks like in, a, in the box. Uh, there's two doses of Narcan in here. Right. Um, Narcan is basically a drug that reverses the effect of an overdose. So this is, this is going to be hard for somebody to understand. Yep, yep. Somebody, it, it looks like they're struggling with an overdose. Yep. I'm going to give them a drug. Yep, yep. Okay. So this was a drug that um, it's, it's a lot of people, um, I think, have some misconceptions about what this drug is and what it's supposed to do. But really what it does is when the, the opioids bind to the receptors on your brain, okay. um, that's when it affects your ability to breathe. So when you give someone Narcan, uh, the Narcan goes on into your brain, into your system, and knocks the opioid off of the receptor and replaces it with the Narcan. So it allows you to breathe still because it, 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 it's got that breathing property to mm -hmm. it. Um, that's why it's important to still seek out medical um, help after you get Narcan um, because even though it knocked it off the brain, it's still active in your system for about 30 to 90 minutes depending on how much of the drug you took. Mm -hmm. So it's important you go get medical attention so that they can medically clear you and take care of you because uh, sometimes people just take Narcan and they're like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm, I'm just going to go about my day. But really you should get some medical assistance with it from as well. But we give this out. Uh, the city gets it. We were part of a community naloxone purchasing program, which is a program. Naloxone? Community naloxone purchasing program. What is naloxone? Naloxone is the um, generic version of Narcan. So okay. Narcan is the brand okay. name. That's what you'll see most common here. All right. um, but it, it, we're part of a state program where we can um, purchase it through their state pharmacy uh, for free, mm -hmm. and we distribute it to people um, so that we can have everybody who needs it have, have easy access to it and without maybe the cost that sometimes it comes with. Because you can get Narcan from a pharmacy, uh, but sometimes depending on your insurance, it might cost you a little bit. So we're trying to make it as low threshold as possible so people can get it wherever they may need it. So we're doing business trainings, we're doing community outreach events, Narcan distribution events, so people can have this drug. Um, so the good thing about it is that it's actually fairly simple to use. Okay. Um, so all you would do, there's two doses of four milligram nasal spray inside of the box. Um, all you would do is you peel back the back part right here, and then you put your middle and your index finger on the top and your thumb on the bottom, just like that. Okay. And so, so I'm going to have you hold it. There you go. All right. So there you go. I'm yep. going like this? Yep. Perfect. Okay. And then... Uh, so then you want to put the, the top part. Mm-hmm up to the nostril. One nostril, you don't have to put it in both, just in one nostril. Okay. You don't want to press it at all because you don't want to test it or anything because all the dose comes out at once. Okay. There were some older versions where you had to assemble and do half in one nose, half in the other. This is way too difficult. I can't imagine <laughs> if somebody's dying in front of me that I would figure out how to assemble something. Exactly. So I'm going to hold this up to the camera, camera three maybe. So we have uh, the two hips here that I'm putting my fingers on. Mm -hmm. And then with my thumb, I'm pushing the red. Yep. 
and shoving this up somebody's nose. So you put the top part right here uh -huh. to the tip of the nose. You want to basically have your two fingers touch the bottom of the nostril. Okay. You don't want to like jam it too far up and you don't want to have it too low. The nostril with the tips of the fingers, that's just right. Mm -hmm. Oh, jeez. Uh, and then once you hit it, once you press it, all of it's going to come out at once. All right. And so you want to wait after you give the dose, about two to three minutes, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to see if the person regains consciousness. Okay. And so you give it, you wait two to three minutes, maybe just take a step back mm -hmm. <laughs> to see if it has effect. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't regain consciousness after those few minutes, there's a second dose in there you can give as well. If somebody has stopped breathing, mm -hmm. will this still work? Yes, that's actually the best time to give it. Um, because if they're not breathing, that means they're not getting oxygen to their brain. So if this comes in and it knocks the opioid off, this is gonna allow you to start breathing again. He, she, they has stopped breathing. Yep. How does the Narcan get through their system when I've jammed it up their nose? <laughs> so the spray goes into the nose and then gets to the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where it starts knocking off the, the opioids that are in the brain receptors. So I don't have to breathe it into my lungs nope. in order for it to be effective. Nope, you just have to spray it right into the nostril. Uh, we still recommend uh, if the person doesn't respond after those two to three minutes, you can give more mm -hmm. than two doses. There's no uh, harmful effect of giving too much. Okay. So even if you gave this to someone who wasn't experiencing an opioid-related overdose, it's nothing's going to happen. That actually happened once for me. Um, I did a, an overdose prevention training, and I accidentally sprayed one in my nose and uh, had no impact on me, So um, I think. Uh, so if well, you give it, actually, it's okay. That actually brings up a good question in the, the few minutes we have left. Yeah. So if I, uh, I, you know, give somebody rescue breaths and I jam their neck or something because I'm kind of aggressive about it, they're, you know, I think they're dying. Mm -hmm. Can I get prosecuted for helping? Actually, no. Okay. Um, the Massachusetts has a law called the Good Samaritan Law, mm -hmm. and it essentially protects you as the person responding and the person who's experiencing the overdose okay. from any type of legal prosecution. And that includes a drug possession charge as well as anything that you were trying to do to support the person that you were trying to do in good faith. So I can't be prosecuted if I'm kind of watching folks who are getting high. Yep. If you call and you're the person who's calling on their behalf, uh -huh. you won't get in trouble for a, a drug charge because the, the hope is to decrease some of that stigma yeah. and some of the barriers of people to call 911. So it's basically trying to take out the legal component and making it more of a medical emergency. Fantastic. How do we learn more? Learn more. So you can email me, uh, mmitchell at somervillema.gov. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram, at Somerville Prevention, all one word. And we also have a Narcan distribution event coming up in Davis Square on uh, November 28th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. All right, fantastic. Uh, I'm Kat Powers. This has been Talking With. Matt Mitchell. Fantastic. <laughs> and um, hope you be safe out there.